Welcome back everyone to another mod spotlight and this time I'm gonna feature MD4 or no, no, it's not Millennium Dawn, it's Modern Day 4 and yes it is a modern day mod as you can see the starting date is 2017 the world is uh, the way you think it should be in a 2017 starting date but it's not Millennium Dawn Millennium Dawn what it tries to do is it tries to port Hearts of Iron 4 into well the 2000 start date without really changing too many of the mechanics or what have you. Uh, whereas MD4 really is a trying to actually make a total conversion mod. Uh, well, as much as Millennium Dawn is in a way a total conversion mod, this one wants to go even further and try to be more hmm, realistic. Love that word. As much as Hearts of Iron 4 allows it to. So, uh, what does it actually do? Well, let's first start with the visible changes to the map. Of course, this is a 2017 map, so it has all of the features that you expect. No more Soviet Union, and blah, blah, blah. This world is politically accurate as of uh, 2017, mostly. Uh, in fact, some of the areas, like the Middle East, are very, very extremely detailed uh, to the starting date. Uh, even to, like, the very tiny enclaves. Oh, God. Uh, yeah games sometimes not stable even to the very tiny enclaves that some of the factions in these civil wars sometimes uh, own and uh, as you can see it has a lot of different uh, little like for example the Syrian civil war is very detailed blah blah but not just the Syrian one you also have the conflict in Yemen you have uh, South Sudan's insurgency uh, insurgency is a normal Sudan the Central African Republic Civil War, the Libyan Civil War, so there's a lot of different uh, a lot of different areas that at the start of the game are embroiled in some bitter, bitter conflicts. There's also a lot of tiny microstates modeled in the map, like Transnistria or uh, Respublica Pridnestrovie, if you live on the other side of the river. Uh, there's the Sahrawi Republic, uh, you know, the Western Sahara independent movement. Uh, there's a lot of different like tiny countries, etc, etc. There's even um, the tribal areas of uh, Pakistan uh, that of course are uh, mostly controlled by, uh, well, Taliban friendly faction of tribals. And yeah, basically this is the map. Uh, Asia is the way you'd expect it to, blah blah blah. Nothing really too strange. Uh, of course, as you know, um, because this is a very early alpha, there's not really all the content in it that's going to be, at, uh, well, a playable date. But what's playable is the Middle East. Because, of course, the AI itself, uh, especially these two guys, don't really have the options of uh, starting up, oh, and this guy as well, don't really have many options of starting up things in the late game. So once everything is solved in the Middle East, things uh, will kind of die down and nothing happens. But what happens in the Middle East is playable, and so you can get a few years of gameplay off of that, and it's very, very fun, actually. Uh, because the AI itself, while unable to start its own conflicts, is very, very active in uh, conflicts that either are, start, are present at the start date or that are created by the player in some way or another. Uh, they send volunteers, they pull and let and lease, and this is not just the United States uh, that does this, it's a lot of other uh, countries, like for example, uh, even France, Germany, United Kingdom, Russia, they all get involved. And because of that, well, let's start to talk about how the political stuff works. Um, there's only a couple of national focus trees. There's one for uh, America, which is kind of um, heavily based on the Trump administration, and what they kind of you know, uh, say that they're going to do. And then there's a Brazilian one, which is not finished yet. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that's, of course, uh, kind of not finished, so I'm not going to really go over it too much. All the other countries have a generic focus tree, which is, I mean, quite okay. It allows you to switch around your ideology and get a few free factories. It's not really anything that major. Uh, for the policies, it is very interesting what they've done, and this is one of the reasons why I say that the game is really trying to make it, uh, well, at least semi-realistic in a Hearts of Iron setting. Because uh, the way you govern your country and your economy is pretty interesting. Uh, there's a few things that don't work yet, like, for example, all of this institutions and policies. And you have your defense companies. Some of them are uh, already pretty much done, like the American ones and uh, the Japanese and German ones, blah, blah, blah. And they're all pretty fine. I mean... 
they are what you expect. Uh, you have things that help out your uh, technology in various ways. Uh, then you have your most, I guess, useful and interesting stuff. Uh, national statistics and internal factions. The internal factions are not done yet, but this would be uh, like various different groups that are going to influence your government. So, for example, as you can see, the Americans start with Wall Street already in there. So uh, it's almost like uh, it's predetermined. And some of these actually give uh, different kinds of bonuses and mouses. As you can see, Pakistan has the ISI, which is the intelligence service. And that gives them a lot of different things, some good, some bad, perhaps. And I don't think there's any other countries that have uh, ones that give actual uh, ones that give actual like modifiers. No, it doesn't seem like it. it does not seem like it. That's uh, kind of sad, but hey, it's just kind of how it works. Uh, yeah, as you can see from the one that Pakistan has, though, these are going to give some pretty nasty uh, modifiers. These are big things. So, uh, looking forward to make... Uh, looking forward to check out uh, what they do with these soon enough. In fact, I think Korea also has a unique one. Yeah, they do. The Chai Bowls. But they don't give any bonuses. Uh, so... Yeah, this is all of this. Um, then you have corruption, you have debt to GDP ratio, which we're going to talk about later. You have economic growth, which we're going to talk about later. And then you have uh, GDP per capita, and that's also pretty important because as we go into the uh, construction, yeah, that's going to be interesting. Uh, just last, last important thing uh, in the politics stuff, other than this government budget, which again is going to uh, hint to the economy. Uh, you have five ideologies in the game. You have uh, Western, Emerging, Southwest, Non-Aligned, and Nationalist. Um, Western is people who want to uphold the uh, world order, as it is right now. Emerging is people who want to in some way change it, for example, China. Uh, Russia also has Emerging, even though it's not technically an Emerging country, so it's just kind of a, a catchword for anybody that might not be happy with the United States or, uh, well, the EU. The EU. And then uh, you have, uh, well, even for example, Iran is emerging. Then you have Salafist, which is people that like Islam. Just, it's like, I don't entirely agree with putting Saudi Arabia as one of that, but yeah, that's just kind of the way it is. Um, because, in, because of this, uh, Saudi Arabia is literally the same as the Islamic State. Which is like, okay, whatever. Um, then you have non-aligned, which is kind of like the ideological one in a way, as in they're kind of just focused on doing their own thing. Like, for example, that would be Turkey or something like that. Uh, in the Middle East, the, the non-aligned is supposed to represent the Muslim Brotherhood. And then you have, well, um, what's that last one? N nationalist, let's find a nationalist country like Eritrea. These guys just... They don't like anyone. <laughs> they dislike everybody. Uh, North Korea is also not aligned. So that's kind of the ideologies. They're supposed to be um, more more than just literally ideologies. They're supposed to be outlooks. It's the way the game uh, refers to them. And that's kind of fine. I mean, I, I kind of like it. Uh, don't really think that having like 17 million different ideologies like Millennium Dawn really makes for decent gameplay uh, because the AI just gets confused uh, and yeah let's get to uh, the research very quickly or maybe should we do the production stuff yeah let's do the production stuff first because I was talking about it so it's interesting because the way the economy works is that um, factories of course are assigned based on GDP but uh, it ends up kind of being uh, interesting because I mean your construction is based on your uh, essentially tax cost right and the tax cost is dependent on how much government budget you are using in these uh, policies so if you have a very high level like for example internal security you're going to get a lot of bonuses but your tax cost which is your consumer goods is going to be driven up that can either be dealt with in two ways you can either suck it up and have less construction or you can uh, run a um, budget deficit which is going to eventually turn into debt, which is going to also pull in more tax costs. So it's kind of like a uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. 
if you run a big deficit. And that's going to allow you to, of course, use more civilian factories for construction, but later on it's going to uh, hurt you because you're going to have more debt. Now, um, that goes into your GDP because once you um, build up your country to the maximum that you can, like, for example, I don't think the United States really can go up. Oh, no, it, it can, okay. Um, yeah, as you can see, to go to, from 50K GDP per capita to 90K GDP per capita, which is going to give you... Uh, plus 40% industries in a state. So that's how uh, how much economy you can fit into a small area. Uh, yeah, you're going to have to either, as you can see, the uh, little requirements, can build zero more civilian factory or can build one more civilian factory if you have more factories in 79. So you're going to have to basically build up to the uh, maximum extent if you want to develop. This is going to be better if you have a stable growth or economic boom, economic cycle, which uh, is uh, done by having political power spent on this. It's kind of like the thing I don't really like all that much. You can just kind of like just spend political power to make your economy grow more uh, in the terms of the game by constructing faster, which is, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, and yeah, uh, this is the, kind of the way big countries like the United States are balanced. Is that, uh, yeah, sure, they have a lot of factories, blah, blah, blah. But they also have a uh, very, very heavy tax cost. So they can't really use all of their factories. And they have most likely a uh, high enough uh, GDP per capita at the start that their construction speed, as you can see, goes down. Because once you start off, you start off from like 1K for. 1k per capita for like the very poor countries that of course increases your uh, population growth it does not give you any penalties to construction speed but it gives you penalties to how many industries you can fit in a state your research time blah 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 uh, so you're less just generally less developed whereas if you are very high up on that scale your construction speed is going to be lowered your monthly population is going to be lowered but the maximum you can fit in a state is going to be higher so um, it's kind of like the fa the farther you go, you grow, you the slower you're gonna be growing. It's kind of the idea, and yeah, that's uh, the way it's balanced, and it's kind of interesting. Of course, uh, the game does not really last too long for this for these mechanics to really come into play and show their strength or weaknesses. So I won't really talk about it anymore. Let's talk about the tech and production. The tech tree is uh, well already pretty good. It's only got the military techs, but it's all pretty fine. I mean, you've got your standard rifles, command equipment, that would be like a bit like support equipment in some ways. Engineer equipment, uh, drones, which uh, give up reconnaissance, blah, blah, blah. Um, then you have tanks, just your normal stuff. You even have like modifications, which this would be the engineer tank version. Then you have um, your APCs. This is what? What is that? I have no idea what that is. Um, yeah, you have your APCs, you have your infantry fighting vehicles. So this is uh, sort of uh, light mechanized infantry. This is the heavy armored infantry. Then you have recon tanks and uh, utility vehicles. That would be uh, like the Humvees and Toyota Helixes, etc. Uh, you have artillery, anti-tank guided missiles, anti-air guided missiles, so man pads, self-propelled artillery, uh, rocket artillery, that's a modification of the self-propelled one. Uh, so it's all pretty good, it's all got their own, like, uh, doesn't have any descriptions, but it's got unique bonuses, unique names, so it's kind of interesting and useful. And the land doctrines aren't really well developed, but there is a tiny uh, embryon of what the land doctrine tree is going to look like. You have the legacy doctrine that are Cold War era doctrines that still have an influence on military thought. And then you are supposed to head down into three categories, guerrilla, decentralized, and network-centric. I'm guessing network-centric is going to be the one that like the United States has. I'm not sure what the difference between guerrilla and decentralized is supposed to be. I Guerrilla warfare is definitely decentralized sometimes, so I don't know. Uh, perhaps uh, this is gonna be like, you know, uh, well, guerrilla definitely for little tiny countries, whereas decentralized for like medium countries. I don't know, uh, most likely. And then you have your um, naval and air stuff, 
So for naval, you have the ships, but not the doctrines. The ships, however, are very well done. You have your uh, nuclear battle cruisers. This would be like the Kirov class for the Russians. You have guided missile cruisers that are good at killing enemy ships. Uh, you have destroyers that are just generally uh, your, I guess, jack of all trades. Frigates, cheap, but not that great. Corvettes, very cheap, no range, not good at all. Um, of course, these can be specialized if you go ahead and look at the specializations over here. You can create variants, you can upgrade various different things to make them stronger at one thing or another. So if you want your frigates to be very strong at anti-submarine, you can do that, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you have your amphibious craft. Uh, that's really just normal stuff. And then you have uh, aircraft carriers and submarines. Submarines are pretty much what you'd expect. You have nuclear submarines, you have normal uh, guided missile submarines, and you have diesel attack submarines. These would be anti, just, just anti-ship, cheaper, but you know, not that useful. You have these guys that also most likely just have more damage and more maximum range, blah, 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 because of course they can fire up those missiles. And then you have, um, of course, the nuclear attack submarine. These ones would be uh, just very, very strong, most likely. But I've never used them, so I don't really know how they work out. Uh, and then you have aircraft carriers, of course, what you'd expect. Nuclear aircraft carriers, biggest, strongest, blah, 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 but extremely expensive. Normal aircraft carriers, a lot cheaper and pretty much the same role, just uh, not as good. You have amphibious attack uh, carriers, which would be uh, the LHAs, okay, landing helicopter assault. These can carry aircraft, uh, but uh, they're like very, very small. I guess light carriers is a way to put it. They're normally supposed to be helicopter carriers. And then you have, as you can see, their deck size is very, very small. Like, for example, the America class has 17 deck size. And uh, in return, it's a little bit cheaper than the normal aircraft carrier. It's supposed to have a heavy shore bombardment bonus. Yes, it does. So it's more useful for supporting amphibious landings and, set and that kind of stuff. And then you have the truly uh, LHDs, so the landing helicopter docks, the amphibious assault vessels. These ones uh, do not carry any aircraft, but they have the shore bombardment bonus and they have a few bonuses. Uh, so. They're just generally useful support vessels. You put one into your fleet and then you support amphibious landings that way. You have, uh, of course, the aircraft. They uh, are kind of subdivided. They ha you have helicopters, fixed wing, bombers, and air doctrines. Yes, air doctrines are in there. And as you can see, they're very well done. Uh, both the icons and, well, I'm not sure about the bonuses. I haven't looked at them closely, but uh, I mean, pretty impressive already. And it's interesting, you have battlefield support and operational integrity. Pretty much what you'd expect, this is just more for uh, close air support, helping out your infantry, whereas uh, operational integrity is more for like winning air superiority, trying to destroy the enemy air force. And then you have, of course, just the equipment. You have helicopters, the attack helicopters are very, very effective at dealing with enemy ground units. You have transport helicopters that are used to, uh, we'll see later, train um, air cavalry companies. Then you have uh, the just fixed wing aircraft. You have air superiority fighters. These just uh, destroy enemy aircraft. You have uh, multi-role fighters. These are basically your jack of all trades. Strike fighters, a middle line between a fighter and a close air support. Light attack aircraft. These are cheap close air support slash fighters for countries that don't really have the production capabilities to build the bigger ones. Like for example, if we look at this multi-role fighter, 54 construction cost, it's equivalent, um, it's equivalent light strike fighter is 19. So as you can see, you can just spam out these a little bit more, but its stats are of course not as good in most categories except, uh, well, ground attack is very similar. Naval attack is very similar. So. Of course, this one is much better at fighting enemy aircraft, and it's slightly better at ground attack, but this one cannot be discounted. And then you have drones. They're basically similar to like the light attack craft, just because they're pretty cheap, just uh, they don't really require a lot of service manpower. Uh, so, of course, 
uh, because they're drones. And then you have bombers. Bombers are basically like they're big, they're expensive, but they do a lot of damage. Pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, you have your close air supports. These are like your A-10s, blah, 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 blah. Uh, of course, naval patrol aircraft. These are very, very strong at destroying enemy ships. Uh, transport aircraft. These are for paratroopers. And then uh, strategic bombers, which have a pretty nasty strategic bombing uh, stat. And that's about it. Uh, these go into the production screen. As you saw already, there's quite a lot of ways you can modify almost any equipment. Uh, pretty much the way normal Hearts of Iron 4 allows you to, but as you can see, uh, yeah, it's got quite a lot of stats that you can change up. And, of course, with all of this equipment being in place, it's not really like uh, in normal Hearts of Iron that you're really mass producing these. You have a pretty low production rate. Uh, what you're supposed to be balancing that out with is uh, in this government budget, the military spending. The higher you go, the more factory output you'll have. So the more weapons you'll get. And, well, uh, this is pretty okay. Uh, so just kind of goes that way. And, yeah, you have all of your stuff that you research. There's, as you can see, quite a lot of equipment. That goes into the uh, unit designer, which is pretty well uh, fleshed out already. This one is pretty much done. And all the countries have mostly accurate uh, sort of orders of battle. They took a long time to actually do this. So you have a lot of different companies that do uh, a lot of different things. Of course, you have the engineers that are going to be helping you out in the various different terrain features. You have heavy engineers that actually have engineering tanks. And then, uh, well, air defense batteries. These are for shooting down enemy aircraft and protecting yourself from that. Our self-propelled artillery recon of various different kinds. You even have tank companies just to stiffen up your guys and get more, uh, get more armor in the fray without really you know this is just 14 main battle tanks so it's not really that big of an investment to put into some of your divisions and then you have your proper uh, battalions you have a lot of different infantry and militias and stuff that can just kind of like yeah these guys are the ones that walk uh, they're more rare in uh, the modern day as they're of course in world war ii but they're still around. I mean, you have Marines, Airborne, ass uh, Airborne Assault Infantry would be the ones with uh, the transport helicopters. They're not yet done yet, but hey. Uh, of course, Marines better at amphibious landings. Light Infantry is just regular infantry. And Militia is just kind of like, yeah, Militia. They're quick to train, not good, but they do the job. Mobile Battalions, uh, Motorized Militia, of course. Uh, they use utility vehicles like those... Uh, Helixes and Humvees, etc. Um, recon, Marines, Airborne. Yes, Motorized Airborne. You can drop uh, Motorized Airborne. That is very cool. And Motorized Infantry. Pretty much uh, your regular guys. And then you have uh, the mechanized stuff. So you have mechanized infantry, armored infantry. I'm not sure what the difference is supposed to be. Oh, these guys have IFVs. Okay, right. They have the IFVs instead of the APCs. So they have heavier vehicles. And then mechanized armored marines and mechanized, uh, well, where is that? You don't have mechanized airborne as the United States, it seems. Nope. Right. I always forget this in modern day mods. The tag is still SOV for Russia. Uh, but if we go here, wait, no. Go here. Uh, where is it? Yeah, like... Um, these guys, Armored Airborne Infantry. So there is even like very, very strong, as you can see their stats are nasty. Very, very strong Airborne that you can pair drop. Yeah, this uh, using, division using this template can pair drop, even though, wait, the artillery can pair drop. Oh, awesome. Yeah, as you can see, all of this uh, got updated to more reflect how like modern militaries have the capabilities to pair drop a lot of different equipment. Even self-propelled AA batteries can pair drop interesting so um you can do some pretty interesting things with para drops in uh, md4 once like wars really start to get going between major countries but yeah um it's pretty okay uh then you have other than of course the uh armored airborne you have of course your tanks these are just no frails destroy enemies take little damage <laughs> they're pretty fun to use 
And then your regular stuff. Self-propelled AA defense is very, very effective at dealing with enemy aircraft, of course, but not really any useful at anything else. Self-propelled artillery does a crap load of damage and can keep up with tanks, just how you'd expect. So that's pretty much it. The way the uh, game balancing uh, of the combat works is actually pretty good because um, I'm not sure what exactly they've done, but the way the conflicts end up playing out is that uh, terrain has a much higher impact on how things go because terrain not only reduces the air support, which is deadly, absolutely deadly in... Um, well, not really deadly as much as very, very strong at dealing with the enemy organization. So air support is extremely important, of course. But terrain just in general provides more... Uh, bonuses to the defender and uh, problems to the attacker as it used to be and the movement takes longer from province to province so you can't really steamroll an enemy as much as you could in uh, normal hearts of iron 4 so what uh, and then they also have uh, kind of they made a bit of a different way uh, the unit losses work so by entering a combat and finding it out, you end up losing less in terms of equipment and a lot less in terms of manpower. So this makes conflicts last a lot longer and it makes it a little bit more of a war of position than it used to be. And especially in these early conflicts in the Middle East where there's a lot of like irregular militaries and then a bit of a sprinkling of professional militaries with all of those uh, units that you saw earlier, it becomes pretty interesting to see like how all of the militias stack up against the uh, like mechanized infantry etc because you can end up using a lot of different types of units at once and uh, you can see the different strengths and weaknesses of each type uh, pretty much right ahead and yeah uh, so more important terrain uh, especially cities are like very very hard to take and mountains are very very hard to take more important terrain more important uh, just attritional warfare in a way and then it's awesome whenever you do get the breakthrough because you can just kind of like roll through and you're like oh finally i've been fighting in this like whole uh battle for i don't know two months and yeah you, you even have like battles that last two months etc uh because you can just keep throwing units in because it's harder to take units down and yeah you can cycle in and out and sometimes you have battles that last quite a bit you finally somehow win it and you're like, oh, great. Uh, so that's basically the way the balancing works. I have no idea how they actually ended up achieving all of this, but hey, better than they did than the, if they didn't. And yeah, if you want to see it in action, you can check out my playthroughs, shameless self-promotion self moment before I end up closing this video. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have a link to those down in the description maybe, I don't know. As always, of course, I'm not the one who made the mod. I'm not the developer, so the mod description uh, mod will be in the description with the link. And of course, all credit goes to the mod creators for making such a pretty cool uh, little mod. Even just if it's an alpha, it's already got some interesting things going on. And yeah, I want to thank you all for watching. I hope, I don't know, you will enjoy the mod and all of that. And I'll see you soon. Have a nice one.